what's coming up on your horizon. Well, during this week of Memorial Day, our focus is on what has become our nation's longest war and the young men and women who fight it. Armed only with their cameras, Peabody and Emmy Award-winning journalist Mike Betcher and his son Carlos bravely followed troops through some of the fiercest and most blood-soaked battles. What resulted is an intensely raw and gripping feature film called The Hornet's Nest. And we'll take you to the world premiere of the film in Mike's hometown of Ponca City. I promised Ponca City when I was finished with this film, we would do it here first. We'll also follow up on work underway to help returning veterans find new careers back at home. Well, the job market's a little difficult. However, uh, this event today has proved incredible. And we end our day with the story of an Oklahoman who's turned a round of golf into a way to help families of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, the United States is in its 13th year of war in Afghanistan, and the stakes have never been higher for our servicemen and women. Yet the conflict seldom gets much attention outside those that serve and their friends and families. But a new film by a longtime war correspondent from Oklahoma could change that. Joining me now is our Andy Barr. Well, Rob, war is a distant issue for most of us, catching only an occasional glimpse of on the evening news. Yet for one journalist, that wasn't enough. In his movie, The Hornet's Nest, reporter Mike Betcher takes us onto the battlefield with the men and women who fight to keep our country safe. It's the glamour of Hollywood with the grit of war. Journalist Mike Betcher has spent three decades covering right wars and terrorist groups. This mission was met. As the chief the correspondent for ABC's here. Terrorism Thanks Investigation Unit, the Betcher embeds with military divisions and okay. documents the reality of so war. In 2012, Betcher embedded with the 101st Airborne in Afghanistan and went to the heart of the Taliban's most hostile valleys. Over the next nine days, U.S. troops fought the Taliban and lost six soldiers. Betcher captured the struggles, victories, and heartbreak of war, and compiled it all into a movie which made its world premiere in Betcher's hometown, Ponca City. I grew up here. Ponca City's my home, and I promised Ponca City when I was finished with this film, we would do it here first. A real-life account of the deadly struggles of war, Scott Morgan saw firsthand. If I'd have written out exactly how I would want a story to be told, it wouldn't have been this good. Morgan is a staff sergeant in the platoon Betcher embedded in and says he tells the story of war just as it happens. It was really nice to have somebody like Mike who is just a 100% genuine person. He's not looking to make a story, he's just looking to tell the story that's there. And for the film's director, Christian Turode, highlighting the heroism of those in combat was key. One, six, Romeo. We wanted to do this when we saw the footage and we realized what heroes these men and women are, are and were. This film is non-political. This is an immersive narrative film made with real footage. David Salzberg is the co-director of The Hornet's Nest and says the film is not based on a true story. It is the true story, just as it happened. If you do this long enough, sometime you're going to find a story that's way more important than the film. This one's it for me. An intimate behind-the-scenes look at the lives of those fighting the nation's longest war. We're hearing from other 
people who lost their sons or lost their husbands. The movie allows them to have closure. It shows what they were doing and what their purpose was for this mission. And for those who fought through it all and made it home. It's amazing and so appreciative because I think people are going to see this and have a better understanding of what soldiers go through, what our families go through. Um, it's, it's amazing. So Andy, I've seen the film and it's really gripping footage. Who shot the principal photography? Well, Rob, there were really three photographers that shot footage for the film. The first was Emmy Award winning war correspondent Mike Betcher, who we've seen. The second was an Army chaplain named Justin Roberts, and the third was Betcher's son, Carlos. Now, this was his very first assignment in a war zone, and it was with his father. And I met up with him on the red carpet, and he said working with his dad was the best experience of his life. Well, certainly an exceptional piece of work. Thank you so much, Andy. Now, when we return, we meet the Oklahoman who has had a front row seat to history for more than three decades. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, Mike Betcher is the last of a dying breed, a war correspondent who lives and works from some of the most dangerous hot spots in the world. During his 34 year career, he's been beaten, shot, kidnapped, even survived a suicide bombing while burying friends and witnessing unspeakable atrocities. Yet he's always gone back to tell the story of the young men and women fighting in our name. I was able to visit with the veteran war correspondent in the balcony lobby of the Ponkin Theater where the Hornet's Nest premiered. Well, Mike, you've been covering conflict, telling soldiers and Marine stories for over three decades. Why make this shift to film? I did television all that time. We used to joke, when you do a television story, it's broadcast and those broadcast signals go off to Pluto. If you're not sitting there watching it, you miss it. These days you can go online, but still it's, it's perishable. A film is something that lives forever. It is an historical document. And, and that's why I felt it was important to make a picture that people could come back to again and again and again, and in the next generation could come back to and say, that's what happened in the war. Give us some insight into the young men that you were over there with. The most amazing young men and women I've, I've ever been around. You know, they volunteer, they raise their hand and say, I will go out there and so you can sleep tonight. And they are smart, they are committed, they love their country. They follow our orders. We're the ones who send them there. And that's why we made this film uh, in their honor. Hey, Roger. Yeah, we're in route at this time. We're SPN. American convoy is traveling this direction. The other way, civilian vehicles. They slowed down when the convoy passed. So did a suicide bomber, and inside his car, he had 600 pounds of high explosives. Private Richter, how long you been in the Army? Uh, exactly a year, sir. That was the first actual uh, trauma casualty I had in my care, sir. Did that make you mad? <laughs> Most definitely. They were just on the side of the road, just playing, and uh, it didn't need to happen. Look, this is the problem I think we have. 99% of the country does not feel the pain of war. Less than 1% does, and it's those young men and women in uniform we send over there. So we wanted to connect that 99% of the country with that 1%, because if they become separated, we lose touch with them. It's dangerous for a democracy. Yeah, and, and as a society, I, we really do have a disconnect from those who not only serve, but maybe those who serve in return. Absolutely, and, and the real war is starting now as they come home. There's a new battle on home. So as these soldiers come back and reintegrate, some are doing just fine. But we've got to help with education, jobs, put them at the top of the list for everything because they, they said 
I pledge allegiance to the flag and to protect the freedoms that have been fought for by generations before them. So if you're a businessman out there hiring, you should be you know, looking first on your list, looking for veterans. Mm -hmm. um, but there are others who, who've come back with, with visible wounds and wounds um, uh, that are invisible, post-traumatic stress disorder. You, know, you see in the film why that could happen. Uh, and so that's why, you know, that's why we made this film, you know, to, so, so people would recognize the sacrifice and now that they're home say, we want to help you. In your film, you're in one of the toughest firefights in Afghanistan to date. Mm -hmm. But I've also heard veterans tell me that war is a, a lot of boredom dispersed by some adject terror. What, what are the soldiers like in the boring times? Oh, they're, they're, they're funny. You know, I mean, they're, they're playing pranks on each other, but they're, they're also drilling and getting their weapons ready. You know, in Afghanistan, there wasn't a whole lot of downtime. <laughs> Council, we were pinned out for four hours yesterday. <laughs> in a brawl. An RPG shot at us. You didn't have a problem then, you have a problem with a chicken. The uh, chicken flew up here and he just immediately oh, no, like... As a 30-year veteran, do these young men and women seem younger and younger to you? You know, when you're out there, and I'm, I'll, I'll turn 60 in one week. A week from today, I turn 60 years old. I'm always the oldest guy in the battlefield and usually have more combat experience than anyone on the battlefield. And I'm, you know, if I'm a journalist and I'm going to be out there covering them, I'm going to be able to hump up those mountains carrying 85 pounds and, and shooting with my camera, or I have to be able to walk through the desert for nine days in 140 degree heat, walking miles and miles and miles. So, you know, for an old guy, I'm in pretty good shape. And, you know something, but they seem the same age as the first U.S. troops I saw in Beirut in 1982. And the ironic thing about it, I've been around so long, um, that one of the soldiers, one of the Marines in the film came up to me and said, you were with my father in Beirut in 1982. So to me, during all my life, I don't feel like I'm, I've grown older or apart from them. They're the same, the same kids I saw in, in Beirut the same kids I saw fighting for us in Afghanistan and Iraq. You were talking about societal changes and it just struck me when you said you're the oldest person there. You really are in many ways a dying breed of being a war correspondent. Just by the very nature of the way news works now, we drop in, we come out. Yeah, you know, I'm the last of my generation still standing in the journalism business. You don't see many old foreign correspondents, but you know, you've got to believe that you're making a difference. I've been given a great gift, the gift of a ticket to the front row seat in history. I watch history as it happens. And I'm there around the world in, in extreme circumstances. What changes history drastically is always war. And, and that's why I end up covering war a lot because it makes huge differences. Uh, it's, war is not ugly, it's, it shouldn't be glorified, but it's always going to be fought and always has been. But we have to be sure that when we commit our young men and women to battle, that we're behind them 100 percent. You're talking earlier to young Sergeant Morgan, he talked about the trust that developed between being, you being embedded, the trust that developed between you and the soldiers. When I come in, they've heard stories about me that I've been around. But I always had to prove myself every time that they think, oh, there's a civilian, first gunfire breaks out, he's, you know, he's heading out of here. No, I'm right up there with him and I stick with him. I don't have a weapon, I have a camera. Sometimes a camera can be a weapon. But, um, you know, they respect that. Um, when they know that I'm going to be there for them, uh, they're to my right and to my left and they're looking after me. And they've saved my life many times. A little bit of shop talk here. I watched you with those little digital cameras. Mm -hmm. How different than, is that than the days of dragging a big beta cam on your shoulder? How Does it make doing this job easier? It makes a huge difference. Couldn't have shot this film with the old gear. Technology allowed me to carry a small camera that shot high definition, uh, carry it thousands of feet. Uh, sometimes it, gets, it got banged around a lot, but it kept working because it was, it was digital. Uh, and because it was light, I could do this. I mean, I had to carry a lot of batteries. On most of the missions, I had to carry my own food and water. 
had to carry everything. Um, and so it, it could not have been done with old technology. Tell me about the promise you made with Company Chaplain on that hill. Huh. That's Chaplain Justin Roberts. And we actually didn't think we were coming out of there. And, and Chaplain Roberts is different from any other chaplain you ever met. He's a guy that's, he's actually on the front lines. I mean, he, he's not back at the chapel. He's out there with the men. He's there for them. If they're wounded, if they're dying, he's right there. But he also carries a camera and the same camera I had. So he was shooting. He was with one squad. I was with another. And as the fight broke out and we got split up, we made a commitment that whoever got out of there alive would come out and tell the story. We both made it out alive, and, and Chaplain Roberts helped us in telling the story. On the personal, your son went over there with you. And from my own experience, my daughter's a Marine, signed up when she was 18. I have to tell you, I wasn't exactly excited because I was scared for her. With your son going over there with you and you knowing what you know, what did that feel like? I was proud when he said he wanted to come, but I was scared too because I would lost so many of my friends over 34 years of doing this job. Uh, but he was bound and determined. He was not gonna take no for an answer. And then I figured out, you know, there are 18 and 19 and 20 year olds out there who are fighting. And Carlos was 22. And I said, that's why he's doing it, because he feels not connected with those people in his generation. And I was proud of him for wanting to make that connection. It was about our father and son relationship coming together, but it was about him coming together with his generation that was out there fighting and wanting to know why, and then telling their stories. Final question, what are your hopes and dreams for this film? I'd like every American to see it. I, uh, we need to make that connection, the 99% that doesn't feel the pain of war with the 1% that does. If every American sees this film, this is my dream. That when you see a serviceman or woman in an airport, and as Americans do now, which is great, they say thank you for your service. The next time, after you see this film, when you say thank you, you'll know exactly what you're thanking them for. And when you see this film, you won't just thank them. You'll give them a hug. Well, Mike Betcher, congratulations on a great piece of work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, honoring those who have sacrificed by serving the families they leave behind. But first, Oklahoma's military connection. Well, despite their servers, the unemployment rate of military veterans still exceeds that of the general population. That's why an initiative called the Oklahoma Military Connection is helping link companies to veterans looking for work. This kind of event brings those people who really are dedicated to hiring veterans and the veterans who need a job. Some of them uh, have tremendous skills that are really needed to keep the business and, and enterprise of Oklahoma running. The next hiring event is scheduled for July 10th, and organizers are seeking both employers and veterans to register. Upon arrival, registered veterans will receive a list of companies hiring in their preferred fields. To learn more about the next hiring event, just go to okmilitaryconnection.com, which we have a link to on our website. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, over 60,000 soldiers have been killed or disabled in military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's the families of these service men and women that Oklahoman Dan Rooney and the Folds of Honor Foundation hope to help. Each Memorial Day, top golfers from around the nation come to Owasso, Oklahoma to take part in what's called the Patriot Cup. Pro golfers paired with celebrities and military personnel play not for prize money, but to raise scholarships and other assistance to give back to the spouses and children of soldiers killed or disabled in service to our country. The event is the brainchild of former F-16 fighter pilot and PGA golf professional, Major Dan Rooney, who's the founder of the Folds of Honor Foundation and the creator of Patriot Golf Day. And it is all up to us uh, to, to honor their sacrifice, uh, to inspire, but more importantly, empower these families with an opportunity of an education. 
Well, since its founding in 2007, the Patriot Golf Day has grown to include over 3,000 courses around the U.S., as well as Patriot Bowling Days and Patriot Marina Days on July 4th, all to raise scholarship money for families of veterans like John Jones. My name is Amber Jones. I am a current student at Colorado State University, and I am a recipient of a Folds of Honor scholarship. This is my first semester back after eight years, and my concentration for school is global tourism. My name is John Jones. I lived and grew up in Oklahoma. I, after I graduated um, out of Edmond Memorial High School, I decided to go into the Marine Corps. I was stationed in uh, Al Qaim, Iraq. Uh, it's in the Al Anbar province, right where the Euphrates River meets up to Syria. Wild, wild west is what we called it. Primarily, we were doing hard hits. Um, we were looking for HVTs, high value targets in the area. I think it was 9.20, 9.15, 9.20 in the morning, 20 minutes after I left the wire, got hit um, with a double stack anti-tank mine. I went through the roof of my thin skin Humvee and then uh, went 25 feet in the air and landed behind my Humvee. I got medevac back to al -Qaim. And then from there, I went to Blad. And then from Blad, Longstuhl, Germany, Longstuhl to Bethesda. So I underwent surgeries in Alkheim, Longstuhl, and Bethesda. It was every 24 hours, pretty much. After he had his initial 32 surgeries, the result eventually uh, was losing both legs below the knee. We decided to leave Maryland and head down to Texas, which was closer to my two stepchildren. Uh, we got married two days prior to heading down to Texas in the hospital with a bunch of nurses and doctors. I became a stepmom at that point, and of course a wife to a disabled veteran. And that's where I took the back, the back step. I was the last on the priority list of what needed to be done and taken care of and all of a sudden school and working and all of those things that I had a lot of drive for and ambition and whatnot just didn't matter as much anymore. It was about making sure John got his life back together and he was able to start walking again. Every single morning I wake up to a husband without his legs. He has to get in his chair, he has to get in the shower, he has to use the restroom sitting, he has to do these things that he will have to do forever. She kicked me in the ass whenever I needed it and got me to where I needed to be and made me go to physical therapy. My son was born missing his right foot due to amniotic band syndrome, which is just a, a fluke thing that can happen to any woman. We found that out at five months pregnant um, and knew that we soon were going to have a son that too would need prosthetics and would face all the different challenges that John had. I mean, we had all the odds against us, let's just say that. And so as long as we kept open communication, which was not easy, especially for a Marine, you've got to really teach them how to talk about their feelings. For the first five years, she sacrificed a ton of um, letting me figure out where I was going to be, figure out what I'm going to do for a career and pushing me to go. Having like an organization like Folds of Honor just come in and be able to, you know, give this money to spouses that, you know, I think they sacrifice more than we do. Because, yeah, we go out and we fight the war, but they're back here every single day doing the bills, taking care of the kids, holding down this fort, which is probably more chaotic in more times than what we were through. She had the harder job. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Folds of Honor Foundation, we have links to other stories as well as more information on how you can get involved to help the families of those who serve. Just go to okhorizon.com. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, it's an annual ritual for much of rural Oklahoma, the summer wheat harvest. The tenacity of the farmers and the people in agriculture is amazing. Unparalleled in my book, that they take these risks knowing that there may not be anything to cut, and yet they do it anyway. And they go back year after year 
growing wheat in Oklahoma through good times and in bad. On Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, there is an old saying in journalism that no story is worth dying for. An axiom Oklahoma war correspondent Mike Betcher says he could not disagree more with. While he recognizes the danger, he puts himself into every time he travels into a combat zone. Betcher believes there's an even bigger danger to our democracy if he doesn't. With less than 1% of Americans now serving in active duty, Betcher believes it is his duty to show us as we sit comfortably at home on our couches just some of the sacrifices made by our nation's bravest sons and daughters. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.